good evening and, and welcome to this talk on the emergence of eco-socialism. In a non-COVID world, uh, we would have been having this talk at Wits University this evening, and all of you would have been part of the graduate seminar room, Southwest Engineering Building. But because of the COVID uh, threat and challenge, uh, we are now convening this talk here in the activist school. Uh, our, our speaker this evening, Quincy Saul, has come all the way from Sri Lanka to be here with us and to, and to share this, this perspective. Now, Quincy is a co-founder of Eco-Socialist Horizons. He's the author of Truth and Dare, a comic book curriculum for the end and the beginning of the world, and Maroon Comics, Origins and Destinies. He is an organizer, translator, musician, and illustrator. He currently lives in Sri Lanka, where he works with the Sarvadoya Institute of Higher Learning. Over to you, Quincy. Thanks, Vic. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, because we don't have the books today, I only have one copy, which I'll pass around momentarily. But I did bring uh, copies of the comic book, so I'll, I'll pass these around. Everybody gets a free copy. Um, I just want to begin by saying that I'm very impressed uh, with this gathering here today. I've been around the world a little bit, and um, it's I don't know how many groups in the world are, have a coherent strategy for climate justice that involves urban and rural, um, all, you know, young and younger and older, uh, nationwide, you know, there's, I realize that there's problems here and you're all struggling with it, but also acknowledge that you're kind of uh, setting a, a standard for the rest of the world as well. Um, so thank you for your time and attention and uh, very honored to be here. Um, Maybe I'll begin by reading, uh, since this, I'm going to be very brief, by the way, because we've all had a long day. Um, but I, since this is about the book, I, I'll, I'll read a little bit about from this book, just to get started. Um, Joel Covell spent a fair amount of time in South Africa. Um, he's, some, he's a son who lives here, Jonathan Covell. Some of you may know him. He's a filmmaker. Um, I'm just going to begin by reading a little piece of this book, and then I'll go into a little bit more who I am, who Joel Covell is, and what, what eco-socialism is. Um, so this is from a check. This is from a, an essay he wrote in 2006, titled Amandla. I'm just going to read the end, basically. The looting of Africa is the looting of its people. The profound alienation of poor Africans is not only revealed in terms of unemployment, AIDS, and all the indices of material misery, but also stems from the memory of a nightmarish past and the failed promises of the present. On the lee side of a great emancipatory event, the weight of 350 years of Europe presses down all the harder. But the sufferings inflicted upon these diverse peoples do not take from them the fundamentals of their humanity, only the means to realize it. It is the job of resistance to enable a new set of means. Here, the activist in Africa has an advantage over her counterpart in the metropolis, for the tentacles of capitalist rationalization reach much less deeply, and the degree of emotion that can be mobilized is higher. Multiple legacies can still be engaged, the still fresh memory of a heroic struggle atop the memories of original society. I remember getting off the plane in 1989 and being directly taken to a rally in March protesting the vile apartheid police who were given to tossing freshly beaten activists from the 10th floor of their headquarters. Never had I experienced such a sense of power coming from a political event. I recall thinking, these people are going to win. Nothing ultimately can stop them. That power, in Zulu they call it Amandla, still reverberates, linked to its response, Awetu, power to the people. It came forth here in a remarkable strike at the university, an institution obedient to the dictates of the master, there is reason to believe the World Bank was directly calling at least some of the shots, and squeezing the public sector just a little more. A year ago, a similar struggle had fallen apart in bickering among the four unions representing the university's workers. This time, they stood together and that wondrous and scarce appreciated phenomenon, solidarity, emerged. Solidarity, the creation of a new human ecosystem through the sublation of the existent, a preserving and transforming the only kind of path toward a better world. The strike sputtered a bit, but then caught on as fire will, a fire that builds as well as consumes. Service staff and faculty shouted and danced and marched together, blacks, Indians, and whites, women and men, people talked to each other, opened up, rejoined. After nine days, the administration crumbled and gave in. The outcome matters enormously to the impoverished lower end of the working hierarchy. But what matters, too, is the fact that solidarity, which is the precondition for another world, is possible and accessible through militant action. 
the making of a new world is contained within the hopes and memories of the existing world. A mandala is its sign and substance. So I uh, hope it's not too risky to read the words of a foreigner about South Africa. Maybe he got it wrong, but uh, maybe there's something that's, that's, that's nice there as well. Um, so Joel Covell is an interesting character. He died two years ago. Um, he was born in New York City. Um, he was a late bloomer for, in radical politics. He started off his career in psychiatry. Um, was, he was the teacher trainer of psychiatrists at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. So yeah, that's, a, that's a job you don't give to just anybody. He was really you know, deep in that world. But then something happened uh, and he became a Marxist. So he didn't last much longer there. Was fired from that job. Um, and then pushed around a little bit. Um, wound up at, at Bard College where then he wrote a book about um, a book called Overcoming Zionism, advocating the single state solution for, uh, for Israel-Palestine and saying what nobody else is allowed to say in the liberal society of the United States, which is that racist states don't have the right to exist. Um, for this, he was thrown out of that job. Um, and that was sort of the context that I met him in 2010. And I was really impressed, you know, that's very, for me, that's very high credentials, being thrown out of two <laughs> top-level positions. Uh, that means this is a serious person. Um, so I met him, I had the, it was a wonderful thing. Um, I had heard of him because I was also involved in Palestine activism, but I didn't, hadn't really read his stuff. And we were part of this artist collective in Harlem, and we had, were assigned to wash dishes together. So it was a nice sort of meeting rooted in use values. Um, and then at that point, I was working as a, as a union organizer in uh, Teamsters 805 in New York City as part of a labor studies program. And I was just learning about climate change, and it was just starting to hit me, you know, how, what does it really matter? I mean, the union density in the United States is less than 5%. Um, and uh, I was wondering, you know, does it really matter how, much, how many members we have if this whole city goes underwater in the next 50 years? And I was sort of struggling with this, wondering what to do. Um, and Joel invited me um, to participate in this editorial collective of a journal called Capitalism, Nature, Socialism. It's an academic journal, which incidentally I invite all of you to contribute to. Um, and, but we were, I was quickly sort of unsatisfied with just doing academic work that was not only just academic, but it was trapped in its commodity form. By the way, that's sort of the point of this book. Uh, all these essays originally, most of these essays originally appeared in this academic journal that you need university access to download. So we sort of like freed them from, uh, now you can read, now anybody can read them. Um, and uh, we weren't satisfied, so we, we, were, we said, let's start an eco-socialist eco organization that we can try to start to organize convergences, bring people together. Let's start organizing around this idea and not just write about it. So that was in 2011. Um, it was sort of right in between the period of the Arab uprisings and Occupy Wall Street was the period that we were having these closed meetings to, to form an organization. And um, the rest is history. We, we came in 2011 to South Africa, COP17, and that for me was really the um, sort of a point of no return for me because I was exposed. I knew eco-socialism was a, a mass thing outside the United States, but I'd never seen it until I came to this you know, event at the Democratic Left Front that Bish organized, and I saw, okay, this is mass politics. This is not just a, you know, a, some abstract theory. Um, and uh, so South Africa has a very special place for me because this was sort of the first, again, it was sort of a point of no return that um, something worth dedicating a life to, a life which lives at the tail end of a civilization, which as you all know is um, coming to an end. Um, the next one's beginning. Um, so what is eco-socialism? Maybe it's time for me to say a word about that. Um, although, again, it's very nice to be in a part of the world where people don't ask that question right away. A lot of people are already quite familiar with the word. Um, it starts off as a dream or a vision which is conjured by the interrelated crises of capitalism and, and ecology and humanity. It starts as a dream of vision. It gradually turns into a line of reasoning and it evolves kind of into an ideology and it you know, reaches into its ancestral roots, becomes a cosmovision. Then it can become a movement as we've seen here in South Africa and other places in the world. And then the dream, the vision, is that it can be a mode of production rooted in free association of labor, um, in which people defend themselves, and just like they'll de defend nature, just like they'll defend themselves. That the answer to the uh, climate crisis, the unemployment crisis, the crisis of capitalism, is for people to be free, free in association and in defense of nature. Um, 
So this book isn't really, every chapter of the book is not about eco-socialism. It's really, this book touches on, there's many themes. It's, eco-socialism emerges in the course of the book through the discussion of all kinds of crises, all kinds of discussions. So this touches on philosophy, ecology, racism, history, climate change, theology and religion, feminism, poetry, war, empire. It's really all over the map. It's um, the first essay in the book is from, get this right, 1990, um, no, sorry, 1990, uh, excuse me, uh, get it right, 1995. And then the last one appears in um, 2017. Um, so it sort of traces a big course. And in editing this book, um, it was sort of hard to do in the sense that there's far more material out there than what's in this book. Um, because he, he wrote on so many themes. He wrote a, a whole book on um, spirituality, he wrote a book about Nicaragua, he wrote a book about white racism, that was his first book, he wrote books on psychiatry. Um, so I only picked the things that explicitly include the word eco-socialism. Um, and I should say as well that um, I feel intimidated because there are people who knew Joel longer than I did, um, and there are people who know this stuff academically maybe even better than I do, but I was sort of put in the position of having to do this because I was his closest collaborator towards the end of his life in terms of organizing, because that was sort of, that was my main goal, is how can we practically bring people together around these ideas. Um, so the structure of the book is chronological, but it's also dialectical in the sense that it goes in order, but then it weaves back and forth, so there will be an essay on, you know, the philosophy of Marxist philosophy and theory of value. And then there will be this article from South Africa where it starts off, he's in the Peter Maritzburg uh, police station trying to defend a student who's been arrested. And then it'll go back into a discussion of, you know, John Bellamy Foster's Marx's ecology. And then it'll weave back into a speech that he gave at the Brazilian Congress um, of uh, Environment and back and forth, back and forth. Um, also in this book are the two eco-socialist manifestos. Um, the, and his two reflections on the Eco-Socialist International Network. So it's a very uh, sort of diverse book in that sense, um, which I hope can uh, sort of speak towards how eco-socialism is something that emerges um, from the, all these, he, he would talk about um, this word interstitial, how it emerges in all these different points. He, he says in one point, it's almost like a return of Che Guevara's Foucault theory. In the sense, everywhere in the world you have some explosion around whether it's like the Dakota Axis pipeline or whether it's the Marikanda massacre. Or it's, everywhere there's these little things popping up and they all include social and ecological problems. And the challenge is to try to coordinate and bring these things together into a larger whole. Um, this work was carried forward. I think I handed this out to everybody. This book is dedicated to um, the first Eco-Socialist International, which is something that Joel wasn't able to participate in because it was towards the end of his life, he was very ill. Um, but I think that this is sort of the, uh, the, the most recent maximum um, culmination of the world eco-socialist movement. There's still a long, long way to go. Um, but I hope that folks will read this and be involved. Um, I'm going to be very brief because my, my greatest hope is that we could have a conversation. Um, and I could respond perhaps to questions that you all have in a way that would be useful rather than just trying to guess what uh, the right things to say are. Um, I'm going to hand out these comic books everybody can use. This is something I worked on with Joel when we first met. You know, we, um, we're, we did a study group in this Episcopalian church in Harlem, and um, I was convinced by this argument put forward in The Enemy of Nature, um, which is that's sort of his main book on the subject, the second edition in particular I'd recommend. Um, but it was like, you know, we can't take this to kids. We can't take this to the union. We can't take this, you know, or maybe you can find one person who will read it. Um, it's really something people are reading in universities or something. Um, so we, we made a comic book um, based on the same ideas. Um, I was sort of the main author, but I was closely supervised by Joel, making sure I wasn't dumbing anything down, but just clarifying the points. Um, the other thing I'll say is that uh, one of the greatest indications I've had of the power of, of Joel Covell's work was um, we, we did a lot of work um, around a political prisoner in the United States named Russell Maroon Schultz, who's uh, he's a little bit like Abdullah Ojalan. He was a revolutionary nationalist who was put in solitary confinement, spent about 10 years, 20 years reading, and came out as an eco-feminist, eco-socialist, uh, women's liberation advocate. 
And um, I think one of the places where Joel's work is getting read most that I know of is in the Pennsylvania prison system. Because this guy is an elder, and he recommended to all his young sort of mentees, if you all really want to know what capitalism is, you've got to read Joel Covell. So I think people are reading him more in the prison, prison system of the United States than in the University of the United States. Um, there's a saying that prophets are without honor in their own countries, and I think that that's certainly the case from what I've seen. Uh, Joel is pretty much unknown in the United States. Um, I'm part, part of the reason I'm sorry that we were not in the bigger thing, it would take some pressure off of me, is that I was hoping to bring up other people who knew Joel longer than I did, from Ashwin Desai to Patrick Bond to Trevor Nguane, all these, Joel lectured for a few several times at, at, uh, at, at, in the University of Durban, um, but you're stuck with me. Uh, so <laughs> happy to be with you, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Um, I'm going to hand these out, and um, I'm very grateful for your time and attention. I hope that's not too brief, but it's better than going on too long. And if anybody has any questions, ideas, how does this relate practically to a particular struggle, I'll be more than happy to answer and uh, do what I can to um, pull together the, the vast potential uh, which is waiting to be unleashed um, in these difficult moments. Thank you. Quincy, I think you need to clarify one word that you used. It's Abdullah Oshalon. Not uh, okay. everyone knows about him. Sure. PKK. Should we take yeah. a few or shall I... Um, a few comments or should I go in right to that? Or? It might be nice if you also linked Joel Kerbel's ideas to what's been happening in South America, yeah. in Bolivia, yeah. Venezuela, the other countries that you've worked in. Sure. Um, what is eco-socialism at that level? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, the last essay in this book um, was actually written as an introduction for a Spanish edition of The Enemy of Nature, which still hasn't been published, but we just put it in here anyway. And the, the, last, the last two pages are titled The Latin American Pathway. Um, and he goes through Mexico, Brazil, Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, Cuba, and Venezuela as places where he sort of sees um, eco-socialism as, as the most vibrant, most possible. Um, my experience in particular has been Mexico, Venezuela, and Bolivia. So I could focus on that. Um, and one thing to, to bear in mind in this is that you know Venezuela is, is since 2013, is explicitly calling for eco-socialism from the level of the state. But then this has been something that's been really embraced and taken up more by the grassroots than by the state itself. Um, campesino movements, the commune movement. I mean, this is something that is very underreported in the world due to the due to the media war. But Venez there are literally thousands of eco-socialist communes being formed throughout rural Venezuela. It's like it's one of the most exciting democratic revolutionary processes happening in the world, and there's pretty much no news that's getting out about it, um, where you sort of have to like part the curtain of all the infamy that's being heaped upon the revolution to in order to get to it. Um, in a place like Bolivia and a place like Mexico, people aren't using the word eco-socialism, but there I would consider it an eco-socialist politics. Or as I did an interview with Hugo Blanco. Who he said, um, you know, the Zapatistas are eco-socialists, even they don't they don't use that word. Um, he said the, the indigenous peoples of the world are the original eco-socialists. Um, something he says in here is that um, eco-socialism will be. Let me I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, but the, uh, there's also he talks about in the enemy of nature um, in the last I think a second to last last chapter he he has a several pages where he discusses the Zapatistas, uh, which is a indigenous. Uh, both armed and unarmed autonomous movement in the, in the southernmost state of Chiapas. Um, but I'll, I will read um, just a short paragraph here from this second to last page. Hey, Patrick. Sorry. All right. Um, where he says, the realization of eco-socialism flourishes in proportion to the degree of contact with nature as an original source of power. I'm going to read that again because it's sort of, a lot of times with Covell you have to read the sentence a couple times because... Um, it's not, it's not that it's uh, academic, it's just it's very dense, but in a, in a deep way. The realization of eco-socialism flourishes in proportion to the degree of contact with nature as an original source of power. It is also fair to say, however, that the, de the degree of mobilization by first peoples is greater south of the U.S.-Mexico border than the north. One major source lies in the indigenous or first people societies of Latin America. This correlates with the greater degree of suppression of indigenous life in the lands that became the United States, compared with the collection of aboriginal nations that became the states of Latin America. Um, and so I, I think that's something to, to be thought through in there, how um, 
the whole Western capitalist modernity philosophically and structurally is built on this schizophrenia, this schizophrenic separation between humanity and nature. And it's so deep, it's actually part of the grammar of our languages. Um, we have any Latin-based Western languages, you have this subject-object dichotomy where the subject modifies the object. If you study uh, a pre-state language, I've studied a little bit of Tzotzil, an indigenous language, you, you have a sense of how um, there's, there's this linguistic term, intersubjectivity, where you have, you know, this, this sub, everything is a subject. And so in order to say, I cut down the tree, you actually have to give tree, the tree uh, a sub, sub, subjectivity. Um, so anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm not rambling too much, but I think that the idea is that um, part of the eco-socialist politics, on the one hand, it's moving forward into the future, but on the other hand, it's seeing the future in the past as well. It's seeing, um, it's seeing that the only way we're going to make it out of this dreadful crisis that we're in is by going back to the old ways. Um, people lived in harmony with the, this planet for the vast majority of human history. Mm -hmm. It's really only in the last, like, depending on whether you go with Ojalan or you go with the, you know, the more traditional uh, theory about it, it's only the last 5,000 or the last 500 years that we've really started uh, to organize this rupture between hate humanity into nature into the mass extinction proportions. So the, the whole vast majority of human history is there for us to draw upon, and the, the, the first peoples are our, our reference point for that. Um, and I think that, uh, I, you know, this is very complicated politics in the same way that you can't really say third world, you know, you, know, you can't say it too glibly because there's a vast world there. You also can't say indigenous too glibly because there's a huge spectrum around the world of who we're talking about here, whether we're talking Africa, Latin America, Asia, or even within a single country. Um, but uh, that has been my experience um, in Bolivia with the uh, water sowers gathering in Cochabamba, which I attended, or the many times I've been with Venezuela, um, working with campesino communities and also the Afro-Venezuelan maroon communities. Um, people are um, living a kind of eco-socialist practice. Um, which I think is hugely important for those of us that live in the metropolis of the world and trying to think about how to move forward. I think we really need a reference point there, both practically in terms of how they manage their, their resources and how they organize themselves, but also philosophically, ideologically, um, how we think about our place in the universe. Anybody else want to say something, or could I invite Patrick to say a word? Or no, we got a, a question here. No, it's just it's just my, um <clears throat> yeah we had a long very long day and um but this 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 book only like like looking at it outside and when I was like opening in the inside it excites me more because this is what we actually like need in our communities especially in the rural areas especially as people working with children mm -hmm. um when I turned in the pages I was like like so excited and I think that Mr. Marcus for Children's Resource Center would be so excited to get oh. a copy like this <laughs> <laughs> and like yeah like briefly <coughs> I, I was like very excited with uh with page uh like page eight whereby um like yeah page eight quickly whereby like there's a picture of a woman having that to our children when we actually teach them about these things like pictures like that we like trigger some like more ideas and more like um creativity and all <clears throat> and also like um engaging them more on how do they have to learn these things and where do they come from so seeing them seeing these pictures will be, will be very like useful and also page 12 whereby like there are people like sitting around the port and all that like showing them that picture and like uh, uh, telling them the story of uh, how indigenous ways we used to like sit in our villages and wh how what is happening now and all that and like lastly in page 33 whereby like there's a picture of like a child like showing hands like this that uh, now, if you're turning a nature into products so how are we going to, I'm um, turning a nature into product actually messes like our, our place. So this is exciting and we I, I just like get like more ideas now whereby when we teach them with this with, with this kind of a book, it's whereby we make some copies and also and, 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 and give them to actually tell more stories from these ideas of what is actually happening around them. This is like so exciting. I like Fantastic. it. Thank you. And please make any, there is no copyright, so you do anything you want with it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> pass, I'm going to pass this book around so people can just take a look at it. And... So, Quincy, I have uh, two questions. Great. Um, 
The one is about how people like um, Bellamy Foster periodize the development of eco-socialism. Um, so, you know, there's this one moment where you have um, those from an ecology perspective uh, arguing, you know, Marx is productivist, economic determinist, and so on and so on, and they bring something to Marxism that it doesn't have. And then you have, uh, I mean, I forget the full periodization, but then you have um, Bellamy Foster and then going to the source and rereading Marx and the classical text. Um, but, and so, you know, you have this whole body of work around rift theory right. and eco-socialism um, from, from the deep structures of Marxist thought. Um, now, when I look at the kind of work you all have been doing and, and some of Koval's intervention and so on, it is not a purist Marxist approach to eco-socialism. Actually, it's very close to the work some of us have been doing in South Africa as well, uh, including a volume I've edited. It's in dialogue with other currents uh, of thought, uh, indigenous people's thought, um, uh, radical ecology, etc., etc. And uh, so, so maybe you want to say something about that. And where would you position uh, uh, Joel Koval's uh, kind of eco-socialism and Marxism? So that's the first question. Okay. The second question is about um, uh, the eco-socialist manifesto. Okay. And maybe you can say, say a little bit about that. Mm. Uh, but you know, how, how, did it, how did it land in the world, in mm. sort of planetary politics? Uh, and, and maybe it's tied to the eco-socialist international, etc. But for now, in my mind, it's standing it's there. So what, yeah, yeah. what are the connections? I'm going to start with the second question, if that's okay, and I'll go to the first. Um, so I came on board with this project long after the manifesto was written. So I, it didn't really have an effect on me that I think others in the room uh, have, know this history better than I do, what kind of effect it had. The way Joel always described it was like putting a message in a bottle and throwing it into the ocean to see what happens. Um, first of all, to say there's sort of two manifestos. There's the first, which was, I think, 2001. Uh, and then there was another which came out of uh, the Belém uh, World Social Forum, which I think that had a little bit more input. Um, I think that, uh, I think, I, I, what do I want to say? I think that um, Joel was inspired by movements that were happening around the world, and that led him to suggest to Lowy, let's write a manifesto. Um, Patrick raised some questions which I think are worth, and worth discussing. Is it top down? What's the right methodology here? Um, I'll just say sort of how I came to this. I remember first when I was some, I had a professor in college, an undergraduate who said, okay, at the end of our class on environmental economics, he said, okay, there's, there's three camps you can fit into. There's the eco-socialists, there's the social ecologists, and then there's ecological socialism. <laughs> and it's one of those things where it's like, it's one of those sci-fi movies where somebody went back in time and changed something accidentally, so now the whole yeah. present is fragmented, you know? It's like, why, why can't these people get it all together? So I, I still don't really know the answer to that. But I remember I didn't take any of that seriously at the time, because it was just, these are just ideas that academics are putting out there. What made me take eco-socialism seriously in around 2010 or 2011 is we did these study groups with Joel. And I went online and started looking, like, what's out there? And then I read, like, the Curitiba Declaration out of Brazil. And I was like, okay, this isn't just some theorists. This is people are making municipal transport policy on eco-socialist politics. So that's what made me sort of want to sink my teeth into it. Um, so that's sort of a, that's just my perspective on how the manifesto fell on me. Um, but I'm, I'd be curious to hear from others. Um, but I want to answer the question on, on Marxism and, and Joel. Um, Joel was fond of saying that uh, he was a bad Marxist, the best kind. Um, best kind of Marxist, a bad Marxist. Um, so he, he would, I think he was always, whenever someone would say, so you don't really uh, agree with Marx on this, you're a little more flexible, he, he would be like, no, definitely a Marxist, but you don't understand who Marx is. And, uh, but not in the usual sort of way we're familiar with, in the sense he wasn't saying, go back and read Capital. He was saying, go back and read the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. And moreover, go back and read the ethnological notebooks. Um, there's a great book by Theodor Shanin, Late Marx in the Russian Road, and it's the first place I was aware of this, that uh, even in Marx's own lifetime, there were Marxists who were suppressing Marx's writings, because they didn't fit their idea of what Marxism was. 
So Marx spent the, this big sort of central part of his life in, econ in e economics. But the whole end of his life, he was, he was more interested in anthropology. He, spent, he learned Russian to study the peasant commune of Russia. He, he has these extensive notes on uh, Morgan's ethnological notebooks on the Iroquois, including like learning the, 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 the local, the, trying to like writing the Iroquois words down. Um, so I think that, um, you know, and Marx said in his own lifetime, we're probably all aware of the anecdote that, you know, je ne suis un Marxiste. He was, someone invited Marx to join the Marxist League, and he couldn't join because he wasn't a Marxist. Um, and uh, I think that um, there's a way in which, um, I think there's a, in, in relation to Foster, I think um, Foster wrote this, this whole book called Marx's Ecology, and I think it's, some, it's somewhat inevitable that someone would have had to write this book, because... Um, Somebody, in order to not sort of scrap the whole enterprise or go back to the basics when confronted with this brand new crisis, which Marxists hadn't reckoned with before, somebody had to go out there and find in the small pieces of Marx a way to just say, it's cool guys, it's all still intact, we can all just keep going with the same thing we did before without really raising deep questions. Joel wasn't part of that camp. He wanted to really ask some hard questions. He wanted to question the labor theory of value as the only way of thinking about value theory. Um, he wanted to bring in ideas like prefiguration. He wanted to really engage with spirituality. Um, and he had, he had a whole theory about how Marx was engaged with spirituality and, as well in a way that's been repressed. Um, but the first entrance in the mega, in the, by the way, in that whole volume is actually about his, uh, some essay he wrote as a kid on the Gospel of St. John, I think, or something like that. So Joel was really, in, he would always, he would, I never heard him say, um, the one thing I heard him really break with, with Marx on, if we want to go into the details on it, was he said something happened to him in between his youthful period and then the part in, in Capital where he says that, um, that, that uh, nature is passive. I can find you the, the, the thing later. He, Marx sort of went into political economy and in the process of describing capitalism, he sort of left out the agency of, the, of nature. Um, so anyway, we can go into some of those details. I, we were, Joel and I were working on writing a book together on some of this subject, and now I'm sort of left with trying to grapple how if I can finish this or not. Um, but I think that uh, part of my learning from this was that Marx is, there's a lot more to Marx in there than is traditionally bandied about by Marxists. Um, and uh, it's particularly the early Marx and the late Marx are very interesting for, for people who are interested in ecology. There are no other questions. Yeah, I'd like to, Patrick, feel free to raise a question, but feel free to say more than a question, because you knew Joel longer than I did. And, uh, yeah, just just yeah. Uh, a quick moment of reminiscence. So uh, did other comrades in the room get to know Joel Covell in his, because uh, in-laws were here in Joburg, and he was occasionally giving speeches. Anybody else? I met him once. Met him once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> dynamic, dynamic. Uh, you know, he was a charismatic a politician. He you know, was a Senate candidate, in fact, a presidential candidate briefly in the Green Party. Uh, Ralph Nader was, uh, you know, the liberal wing, and he was he was the eco-socialist. So he certainly put out um, his arguments for everyone to uh, debate, and he would do visits. So for us in Durban, uh, when I ran a center for civil society at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, um, six months with Didi Didi Halleck, his wife, uh, who was a sort of media critic and uh, exceptionally good on, on pedagogy. And they had a blast. Their main tour guide was someone you may know, Ashwin Desai. And to go into the, all the interstices of the strange and wonderful and chaotic parts of Durban stimulated Joel. He just kept that going and would always encourage us to have a little capitalism, nature, socialism network there. Generous, you know? He's a great model. Um, what we did do, though, if I turn to exactly where you finished, um, and what a great talk, Quincy. Thanks. Sorry, it was way for Sunday. The main thing is, um, when Joel was confronted by this profound contradiction, uh, which is Marx and the law of value and Das Kapital, which is the sort of essential process of capital and labor, and then see so much else around, all the things you described, the, the celebration of, of the Native American and, and, and the potential for that mode of production, just the way you finish your talk, to be uh, very informative for mutual aid. I think if I can very quickly sum it up, there is a framing that developed after Marx died, which I think needs now a more a robust um, debate in and around eco-socialist circuits. And that's um, uneven and combined development. So that theory, which has a little bit of a Trotskyist sort of 
uh, tradition, actually is something Rosa Luxemburg brought to life when she studied nature and indigenous people and women and mutual aid in the first Marxist studies of Africa. It was in a 1913 book uh, called The Accumulation of Capital. To me, um, that's Quincy where the contradiction, where you, in the end of your talk, look back to indigenous life and mutual support that occurs on a humanistic and an eco-respectful basis. Um, and then if you look forward and you're thinking, like, right now we need modern medicines to hit uh, this coronavirus harder, uh, ARVs that South African activists got decommodified through massive struggle are part of that, modern water and sanitation systems, electricity. Um, so it, it poses the problem post-development, theorists did in, in the 80s and 90s. People, you know the names, Vandana Shiva, Jim Ferguson, Artur Escobar. And it seems to me that can be resolved in the most unequal country, this one, by bringing uneven and combined. And we've had many talks with Joel about this, because combined, well, uneven is like the northern suburbs of Joburg, sucking in capital, impoverishing the rural areas, impoverishing the rest of the continent. That capital accumulates unequally, and we're the epitome here, aren't we? But combined is capital and the non-capitalist. Nobody wrote more eloquently as early on as, as did uh, Rosa Luxemburg. David Harvey calls it accumulation by dispossession. Joel was completely into that. And I think a consistent framing lets us do both. Celebrate that which is right. historically profound because partly capitalism destroyed it and the resistance and the residues of mutual aid systems in indigenous life is part of anti-capitalism, <coughs> profoundly. It's not, it's not a defense of feudalism. It's not uh, some throwback. But likewise, um, socializing those technological and socially integrated characteristics, like the existence of a proletariat that only capitalism gives you as a driving force, you know, has to be part of that. And wow, if we uh, can't do it in this country, no one could do it. I mean, we have a, a, a united front uh, with all the potential, okay, lots of divisions that make it difficult to realize, but we have so many aspects that Joel was really attracted to when he did his, his six months here and kept coming back, uh, partly because of his Joburg relatives. I think that's something that I always respected him when he did CNS um, uh, reviews of our articles. We even had a special issue for the Climate Summit in 2011. He kept pushing <coughs> us to do that theorization because I think this is the window we have. And I hope it is something, uh, Quincy, that you also respect when you look at indigenous. Mm. Yeah, but, you know, okay, I know only the Zapatistas I hung out with, but they demanded free electricity. They yeah. blocked the roads for free water. You've been there, yeah? yeah? So there was something in there that was modernizing, or let's say liberating, yeah. for example, of women who don't have to now walk two hours to get water because a clean piped water system. Hey, and to deal with coronavirus, it's, it's only hitting the petty bourgeoisie who travel to Italy for skiing holidays <laughs> right now, but soon it'll hit, it'll hit all of us. Fuck, we're going to need that resistance to uneven and combined capitalist development. Joe would have been right there. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, if you don't mind, if I can I comment on that? Or, of course. Um, no. Uh, thank you. Um, and again, you know, I said before you came in, I'm intimidated to be here because people know some of this stuff better than I do. And, uh, but anyway, but um, the, the, for me, the, the selling point around eco-socialism wasn't so much that, you know, a well-articulated argument that capitalism destroys the environment. We sort of all know that already. For me, it was the fact that I'd spent my life kind of split between uh, it being, you know, convinced of the Marxist analysis of capital and labor and the need for organized labor to you know, the whole tradition of revolutionary socialism that comes out of the industrialized world, but then being really drawn since I was a young age to the, the, the indigenous cosmovisions of the world, which insists that everything is sacred and, you know, it's this whole, and that never the twain shall meet kind of thing. And I would sort of go back between one meeting and another and try to bridge them, but sort of unsuccessfully. And for me, it was Joel's sort of inno innovative, uh, he's pulling together other people's ideas, but I think it's innovative the way he put it together, of the theory of intrinsic value of nature. Um, which to me is, I kind of think, I kind of think about it as a keystone to an arch that connect, can connect proletarian struggles and indigenous struggles. Say, you know, there's, we acknowledge that there's something sacred, that's something, the thing that all the great religious traditions of the world have in common, that you can't serve God and mammon. Um, but then putting that theoretically, couching that inside of a, of a coherent Marxist political economy analysis, I don't know that that had been done before. And I think that there's a very special place in the history of ideas 
Um, it's one thing to articulate an argument well, but um, the inventors of new categories um, in sort of I'm not I don't not well versed enough in Hegelianism to like give the full discourse on this, but um, there's a very spe special place in history for the theorists who who innovate new categories of thought as opposed to just moving the categories around. And I think Joel was one of those. And if humanity survives this gauntlet of world war and mass extinction, uh, I think they'll look back to Covell as, as one of the people who figured it out. Other questions, comments, uh, criticisms? Joel was a big fan of ruthless criticism, so that's welcome as well. I don't know anything about the book, sorry. But I just have a question which is, I mean, I also came in very late. But this is something that I was thinking about, sort of always, you know, when I'm thinking about the criticism, is like the romanticization of indigenous people. Isn't that also problematic? Yeah. Um, and, I mean, I, you must have obviously spoken about that. But, I, you know, and... I mean, I could sort of see both sides to it, though, because someone like, I've just been, I'm actually in literature, I've just been teaching, and this is a, a tempest, and in that, there are very specific um, passages where Caliban, like, claims um, this eco-critical view of nature, um, and that was, he, and Cesare is a Marxist, right, and, um, yeah, I think he was also quite, maybe, aware of the problems of romanticizing that, but at the same time it is there. Um, so this is just like a kind of a, a dialectic in my brain, is like how, you know, the problems of romanticizing this, but at, at the same time there was, there is something there. Right? I don't know if I'm making myself yeah, clear. Absolutely. Because, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I certainly don't have all the answers to this question, but I can comment as somebody who's has romanticized indigenous people and then worked with indigenous people and, you know, gone through this sort of uh, gauntlet. Um, you know, I think in the United States, for instance, it's like it's hard to even find indigenous people unless you go to the go to one of the reservations. And then you go somewhere like Bolivia, and everybody is indigenous, including the businessmen, or that you know. And so, it's what does this word even mean? You know, I currently live in Sri Lanka, where the majority population is Sinhalese. They have a two thousand year old written history, uh, older than the Mayans, right? But then they are they have a colonial relationship to the Ved, the forest people. So who's indigenous? You know, so I think we need to, in the same way that you, we need to unpack the concept of third world to understand, you know, we need to really be a little bit more careful. And also the language is very, you know, in the United States, you, you're not supposed to use the word tribal, right? It, but in, in South Asia, you're not supposed to be indigenous. It's the opposite. They use the word tribal. Um, we, need, we all need to look out for the danger of romanticizing any subjectivity. Um, there might be a greater danger among, you know, people who live in industrialized societies of I think we may run a greater risk of, in, of romanticizing the industrial working class. <laughs> Maybe the direction needs to swing back a little bit. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, there was, I remember Ashwin had this great comment uh, in, back in 2011. He said, you know, um, we have to be more serious about subjectivities. You know, we used to believe that the working class was genetically programmed to go beyond capital, and then it turns out they can be assholes like anybody else. That was Ashwin's comment. So I think, yeah, we have to be very careful and serious about this, and if you do any work uh, with these people anywhere in the world, you realize that everybody's human and that there's a lot of complexity to this. Um, but given the fact that for the last 500 years the direction has been criminalizing, dehumanizing, referring to these people as, as savage, as undeveloped, I think maybe the pendulum needs to swing a little bit the other way and acknowledge, if not romanticizing, acknowledge that these people hold the key, I think, to how to live on this planet sustainably. They're the only ones who are doing it. Um, so I think that there's a, I would, I, uh, and I'd love that book by Cesare, by the way, if that's worth anything. But, uh, yeah. And Discourse on Colonialism also yeah. basically says that it criticizes Europe for being barbaric. Mm, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Europe is morally, spiritually indefensible, right? So. Uh, just, just two issues, because this, this conversation has just triggered a, a whole lot of things for me. I mean, the one issue is, is the late marks that you spoke about, and the ethnological notebooks, and Shanin's work, and Anderson's work uh, around multilinearity. Um, where, you know, Marx wasn't about, you know, one trajectory into a, a socialist future. You just build on capitalism and you move forward. And, and, and as this kind of the late Marx story has been pieced together <clears throat> around multilinearity, uh, 
you begin to think very differently about history. Uh, and you begin to appreciate that uh, in this sense, the role of peasant societies, the role of um, indigenous societies and so on, um, they, have a, they have a place in this multilinear transition. Um, and it relates to, to the bigger challenge of us theorizing a transition beyond capitalism. Uh, it's not just going to be built on capitalism. So that's, that's the first thing I just want to throw into yeah. the conversation, and maybe you can comment on that. Yeah. But the second thing is that I, I think there are a lot of tensions in Marx's ontology on nature that are unresolved, yeah. even in economic and philosophical manuscripts. Yeah. And I think some of it is faulty, and particularly in how he relates the human and the animal. Uh, I mean, he has this progressive view of how the human being develops towards communism and flourishing, etc., but it's a departure from being animal. Uh, and I think there's a whole set of questions to be asked there about this, uh, and, and, and whether Marx is still stuck in an anthropocentric place, mm. and that maybe we do need a different ontology of nature, and an ontology of nature that recognizes, firstly, that uh, nature is more powerful than human beings. We are part of the natural order, mm. but nature is more powerful, and it's going to be even more powerful now with its revenge. But the second thing is that we are dependent on nature for our reproduction. And I think this is where the Marxist left has to grapple ontologically with the question of nature and where do we fit into it. I don't think all the answers reside in Marx. And I think this is where dialogue with indigenous peoples becomes absolutely important. Fantastic. Um, I don't want to risk not knowing, but I'm pretty sure Joel would have been thrilled with, with that kind of a comment. Um, the other thing I could mention is, I, I don't know if maybe there's things other in South Africa, but this journal that he edited for years, Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, is the only journal that I'm aware of where that kind of, a, of an intervention, I think, can really find a, a home. Um, you know, so uh, no, no, no disagreement. I think that this is the kind of, this is, in, insofar as the theoretical work is our priority, I think this is the, everything you mentioned, that's, that's our top priority. And I think that, um, that it has practical con uh, con pr practical outcomes for our organizing. I think that you know socialists who are going out there to be in solidarity with indigenous people, but have a kind of a condescending attitude about they don't really believe in all that sacred stuff, and really these guys eventually will just get jobs in factories and become proletariat. I think that's part of why there's not better solidarity. These days, people are a little more honest. You don't find socialists saying that kind of thing, but I don't know if the ideology has really changed. Um, and so I, I really welcome that, and I think Joel would have as well. And yeah, Mark said um, that the uh, in this in the he said you know that the, the the peasant commune could be a better point of departure for socialism than the than the bank clerk. Um, that's kind of thing that nobody talks about that, and it blows my mind that you know in Marx's ecology, Foster doesn't touch on stuff like that. I don't know why. I think for me, that's the most fertile point of departure for a Marx's eco ecological politics. Thanks, Vish. I don't want to keep people here any longer than they've been in this room for a very long time today. Um, any final uh, comments, criticisms, uh, declarations? Um, just to say a big thank you to you and for this great intervention and for sharing all these resources in the spirit of Joe Koval. And we look forward to learning from this and engaging you further as we thank go down you. this journey together. Thank you, Vishen. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I, I, once again, thanks to all of you, there's no possible better venue for this kind of a discussion for me than a very serious strategic conversation around how to organize for climate justice. I can't say how it's really an honor to be able to present the book in that context. Um, and so thank you. And Joel thank would have been happy with that. Thank you.